I just was handed these documents reportedly. They're from a Facebook page. Um, I don't know the relevance of them. I'm objecting to them. <clears throat> Your Honor, uh, on direct, Ms. Clearman just opened the door. As to the peacefulness of Mr. Clearman, uh, the relevance of the Facebook post show otherwise. And the <coughs> these Facebook posts don't show anything. First of all, counsel, start by identifying them. Your Honor, it is the screenshot of Ms. Um, Jason, Mr. Jason. And who got these screenshots? It's publicly available online. Tell me who got the screenshots. We got, we got the screenshots. Who? Uh, Stop saying we. Who? The, the defense counsel, uh, the paralegal, Ashley just printed them out just a couple minutes ago. Ashley who? Then again, Ashley is a witness in this case. Step out for the rest of this trial. Sidebar. All right, so the judge understandably not happy about what was going on there. I'll tell you what I see. I see a big authentication problem. Anytime you want to introduce something that is digital, you have to authenticate it. You can't just say, oh, I, I printed this up off of Facebook and this is what it purports to be. No, you would have to have a digital expert pulling whatever the, the content is, testifying before the court under oath that, that what is on the piece of paper in the courtroom is what was digitally extracted from whatever account. Because we all know it's very easy to fake things online. Think about it. There are apps that can even create text message conversations. And so um, the judge called that sidebar. Of course, we're not privy to what is being said at the sidebar. Uh, but let's go back in uh, and watch some more. Um, I understand that they are finished with the sidebar. And let's see what the result is from the court's decision so-called potential exhibits. And I believe it's Ashley that's your paralegal. She is now potentially again a witness in this trial. She is out and not allowed back in the courtroom. You have twice made her a potential witness. Yesterday there was testimony that she may have held herself out as a police officer. Judge. Today there's testimony potentially that she, just within the last hour, with no notice to the state, printed out what are allegedly, what purport to be Facebook posts. In both cases, she might be a witness. That's never intended on calling her. She just does some internal research. She's never taken any statements, uh, never written a report. We never named her as a witness. She just assists us in collecting certain things like news articles, videos, things like that. Just be judged. Right. Counsel, for situations like that, you should use an investigator, not an employee of your office. Mr. Hubner, can you address this, please? Well, Your Honor, I would just simply state that. You use the mic. mic. Neither yeah, side is using the mic. We all use the microphones. I just put it away so that I can mumble. Um, judge, the. I, regarding, the, regardless of that issue, my point is I don't understand the relevance of two Facebook photos, two Facebook, I, I, I guess a slideshow of stating that other people may not like Jason, but the wife likes Jason. Like, I don't understand what the relevance of this is. I don't understand the relevance either. Judge, it was, so the relevance- I also don't understand how they're gonna be authenticated. I don't know when they were taken off of Facebook, which again, counsel is why your paralegal is now a potential witness. Sorry, Judge, what's the question? What's the relevance? So, Judge, Attorney Hubner elicited on direct that from the witness, at least she testified, he asked her a question, then she, she answered, I think, a little differently, and she said that Mr. Clearman is a peaceful guy, he is into conflict resolution, something along those lines, and that, you know, the, the state's trying to introduce that he's of peaceful character. The statement or not the statement, but the Facebook post just has one tagline which says, we won't get along, and that shows the name Jason Clearman. We probably won't get along is the exact language of that, and there's a picture of a gorilla. Now, as far as authentication, I think we could simply just ask her, and we don't need to show this to the jury, we can say, is this his, a fair and accurate representation of his Facebook profile, if she says no, and that's the end. We're not gonna to try to rebut that, and the jury doesn't need to see what it is. But if she says yes, then she can confirm that that is what is 
tagline was, and that's pretty much it. It's not really, we're not going to show it on the projector. We're just going to hand it to the witness. Mr. Yudner. I don't see how a Facebook profile of him saying we might not get along has anything to do with character for, for peacefulness. There are plenty of people that I don't get along with that have never punched me or shot me in the face. It says we probably won't get along. It's right. The one Facebook post, it looks like it might be. I don't know how to describe it because as far as I'm concerned, Facebook is part of the downfall of society. And I'm not on Facebook, thankfully, but it looks like it might be a possibly a screenshot. One that says, Jason Clearman, we probably won't get along. Then there's one that says Evangelina Clearman, I, however, do get along with him. That's relevant how? In terms of peacefulness, if you're somebody who just doesn't get along with others, if that's, you know, the proposition that the Mr. Clearman is putting on his own page, then I think it relates to, you know, his peacefulness, or I think that's a jury question to decide, Judge, if he's a peaceful character or unpeaceful character. We've seen the video, so we're aware of some of the basic facts in this case and how this ends up happening. We've heard language as well. Um, I think that since it's been introduced, I think it's fair game, Judge. If it wasn't, then I think the state would have a much stronger argument to exclude this. I disagree. It's irrelevant. A screenshot of one Facebook post shows nothing, and your paralegal stays out. She's now a potential witness on two times. She's out for the rest of the trial. Judge, we're not discussing this anymore, counsel. We're not discussing it anymore. A may my ruling. It's out. It's irrelevant. I'm sustaining the state's objection. Let's bring the Vic, <clears throat> let's bring the witness back in, please. Just as I suspected. They have an authentication problem. The defense has an authentication problem, pulling those documents, and you heard the judge say it right there. And what are you saying about this paralegal? Apparently, there is some woman who works for uh, one or uh, both of these defense attorneys. I'm not quite sure who she's employed by. Um, but she's been doing some work on the, on the team's behalf. And there's an order from the court that witnesses are to be separated. That is why the judge was angry, and rightfully so, that she was present in the courtroom. If she could potentially be called to testify to either of those issues, uh, the one that came up yesterday that was problematic or this one, she cannot be in the courtroom. Okay, so we see the defense team not quite, quite ready to cross-examine this witness. If you're just now joining our coverage, we thank you for tuning in to Court TV Live. Uh, this witness is arguably the most key witness to the state of Wisconsin's case against defendant Theodore Edgecombe. This is a homicide case. We know a homicide happened back in September of 2020. What we don't know is whether or not it was an unlawful killing or a lawful killing. The state says it was unlawful, it was murder. The defense is putting forth a self-defense case, as we understand it from what we've seen in the opening statements, and pretty soon they're going to get their turn. We're going to squeeze in a break. Uh, it seems the witness isn't ready to get on the stand, uh, and the judge may be calling for a break there, too. I promise you won't miss a thing. Stay right here with Court TV Live. Was it murder or was it self-defense? We are watching a road rage shooting case in Wisconsin. We're going to go back in now exactly where we left off. We're seeing the widow of the alleged victim in the case, who was also an eyewitness to the shooting incident on the stand. Now it's time for the cross-examination. Good afternoon, Ms. Clearman. Good afternoon. 
I understand that first from the defense, we want to just express our condolences for your loss. If there is, we obviously, this is a very serious issue here as Mr. Edgecombe is charged with very serious charges in this case. If there's ever a moment as we have to get into a couple of sensitive topics that you just need a moment or so, if the court was so allowed, we're more than happy to grant that, mo that moment for you if necessary, okay? All right, so I want to just first start, Ms. Clearman, I guess I want to kind of. Can you put the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. All right, so Ms. Clearman, I want to just first start <clears throat> kind of at the, toward the end of this situation. Um, you, you indicated on direct examination that, you know, you, you exited the vehicle at the time that Mr. Clearman was shot, correct? Can you rephrase that? Okay, so once Mr. Your, your, your husband, Mr. Clement, was shot and Mr. Edgecombe left the scene, correct? You seen him go down the stairs? That's a different question, isn't it? Did you see, you, you, I'm, 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 <clears throat> you know the time that once your husband got shot, you see Mr. Edgecombe go down the stairs immediately afterwards? After, if I understand you correctly, after my husband was shot, I saw the man on the bike go down the stairs. Correct, right? That's correct, yes. Okay, all right. And then immediately after that, you got out the vehicle, about six seconds or so, you got outside the vehicle, right? I remember getting out of the vehicle, yes. Okay, and you indicated that you, you ran over to your husband, right? Yes, I ran over to him. Okay, and you, you put your hand down, you indicated that you put your hand down, hit your hand down on his body, is that correct? On his back. Okay. Because I wanted to see if he was alive. Okay, and you concluded at that time that he wasn't, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, at this time, I want to go into uh, State's Exhibit number... Three, please. Okay, I believe that is the. Something I just wanted to point out that's really great to see is the civility in the courtroom between the lawyers. Defense counsel is asking the state to queue up its exhibit. So if you look closely, you can see the prosecutor in the gray suit there with the laptop. He's the one controlling that video for defense counsel to use on the cross-examination is the state's exhibit. But oftentimes in courtrooms, you've got one big projector, one big television screen, one laptop, and both sides have to share. Uh, so a kudos to attorneys on both of these sides of the case being civil with one another as they both do the jobs uh, that they're required to do.
Stop it. I always go out there. So, Ms. Clearman, did we just hear you say he's okay, right? Correct? That's what I heard. And you, you were asking law enforcement that at the time, right? I was asking someone. I don't know who I was asking. Okay. But you were asking whether your husband was okay, correct? I don't know if that's who I was referencing to. Was there anybody else that you could potentially be referencing at this moment? No. So it would likely be your husband? Most likely. Okay. So that would indicate that at the time that you got out the car to go place your hand on Mr. Clearman's back, you didn't confirm whether he was actually alive or not at that time, correct? I did. So? I did. I saw his hands purple and he was gurgling at his mouth. Okay. It's gurgling and there was blood, a pool of blood on the steps. Okay. And he was cold. Okay, can you explain to the members of the jury why you asked the question then, is he okay? I was in shock. Now, Ms. Clement, you also indicated on direct examination that at some point you went again to Mr. Clement's body and you grabbed an item from the scene, correct? That's correct. Right. And you indicated that you went into Mr. Clement's pocket, correct? I reached into his back pocket and removed his wallet. Okay. And you indicated that the reason you did so because you wanted something of him to hold on to, correct? Yes. Okay. Is there anything in Mr. Clearman's wallet other than credit cards or anything that we should know of? No, okay. just credit cards. So at the time, you just wanted to hold on to Mr. Clearman's credit cards at that time, correct? His wallet. His I wallet that contained only credit cards, right? Um, ID, I don't... Um his IDs, his work IDs. Um, other items were in there, yes. Okay. So basically IDs and credit cards, correct? Yes. Okay. And those items were of particular importance to you at that moment, right? What do you mean by that question? Well, Having possession of Mr. Clearman's credit cards at that time was partic of particular importance to you at that moment, correct? Having his credit cards? No, just his wallet. Okay, I just so, wanted to hold onto his wallet. Okay, so it wasn't the content of what was inside the wallet. It, was, it had nothing to do with the content in his wallet. Okay, so it was just the wallet itself, correct? Correct. And it was just a leather wallet, correct? It's just a leather wallet, correct. You are not going to miss a moment no, of this critical testimony. We're going to hit the pause button, so to speak. We'll be back with more live after this. Thanks for staying with us. We want to go back into the courtroom now and see more of the cross-examination of the widow of the alleged victim in this road rage shooting case. Evangelina Clearman is her name. She's on the stand, uh, been cross-examined for uh, just a few minutes time. We're going back in at the moment where we left off after she was just talking about grabbing her husband's wallet. Now, you indicated on direct that when the first incident occurred, you stated that Mr. Edgecombe came from in between of some, a couple cars in front of you. Was that right? Well, it all happened really quickly. I'm driving west, westbound on Brady. I passed Tynamite, <clears throat> excuse me. And as I passed Tynamite, I see the bicyclists he comes out onto the, onto the road, off the curb, I'm not sure. Well, it was off the curb or between parked cars. But it, he, he came out onto the road. Okay. So he wasn't going a particular direction at the time. You're, you're indicating now that he was coming in between two parked cars. He, he was riding, 
he came out onto the road on his bike, riding his bike in, in front of my vehicle. Okay, and was he, he was going the same direction as you when, did he turn the bike the same direction as you? The same direction that you were heading on, on Brady Street at the time? He was riding his bike towards me. Okay. He was riding his bike eastbound on the westbound lane. Okay, so he pulled, you're saying that he pulled out between two cars and then he turned the bike in the, in the immediate direction of you. Is that correct? He got off, the, he came onto the road from the sidewalk on his bike riding towards me. Okay. And you Well, he was on the right side. He came out onto the sidewalk. If, if I can make this clear, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. I'm driving down Brady. And the bicyclist all of a sudden is in the road on the right side of my vehicle and I swerved to avoid hitting him because he came out so quickly and abruptly and it startled me and I turned my car. Now, do you recall seeing a bike lane on Brady Street at that specific place? Is there a bike lane you're asking Yeah, did you see a bike lane? A bike light or bike lane? Lane. Okay. Um, I don't recall a bike lane. Okay. So you didn't indicate to Mr. Rottrell Cameron that he was going the wrong direction in a bike lane? That would be an accident. Who? Mr. Rottrell Cameron? I don't know who that is. Okay. Do you recall Mr. Cameron? Do you remember anybody being at the body with you, Mr. Clement, as he laid there? Do you recall anybody being there with you? I was the only one there by the body. Okay, and that was, is that true for the whole evening of September 22nd of 2020? What do you mean by the whole evening? Okay, so you never came in, are you saying you, you never came in contact with anybody when you, when you were present with Mr. Clearman? Nobody else was around, correct? At the time that I went to his body? How many times did you go to the body? Twice. Okay, on the first time, was there anybody around? No one was near me or around me near the body. I was the only one near the body. Okay. On the second time you went to the body, was there anybody around? No one was like right next to me. There were two people standing there by, by, the, by the car. By which car? Um, by the red, there was a red truck behind my car. Okay, so there was only two people. Can you, can you describe them? Um, I recall a red truck, I recall a female on the passenger side, and I believe it was a male, but I can't, I think, believe it was a male who was the driver. Okay. They, were, did, no, no. they were standing there. Okay, were they standing there together? Um, I cannot recall. Did, did they appear to come together? When you mean, do they appear to come together? Do you mean did, like in the same vehicle? Or? Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me let me just let me just clarify. Did both the the man and the woman both come out of the red SUV? From what I remember, when I turned to ask for help because I noticed there was a vehicle, the woman stepped out of her car and was standing outside her door, and the gentleman was. Um, also exiting his door. That's all I remember. Okay, so they both came out the red SUV. Then, yes. Right? Okay. All right. And those are the only two people that you recall being present with you on those two occasions that you went to Mr. Clemens' body, correct? Refer. Can you re repeat that? Those are the only two people that was around in that area at the time that you went to the body of Mr. Clement, correct? Yes. That's, that's, I didn't, I didn't scan the whole area. I just focused on those two individuals. I didn't focus on anyone else. Okay. So, have you ever heard the name Rottrell Cameron before? Not till today. Okay. And you don't recall anyone else, African-American male? So it, so it would be two African-American men at that time. You don't recall that at the scene, at the time? that you went and approached Mr. Clemens' body? 
No, I don't recall that. And when you were at the body, did you ever call anyone and say something on a, were you on the phone with someone when you got out the second time? Can you elaborate well, a little bit? Sure. When you, when you got out the vehicle the second time, right? Were you on the phone at the time that you exited the vehicle? I, I don't recall. Okay. You don't recall being on the phone with We're going to hear all of what is ahead in this cross-examination. We have to squeeze in a break. We're hitting the pause button. We'll get you right back in after this. Welcome back. What do you think of this cross-examination so far? Find us on social media. Let us know. We're going to go back into the courtroom exactly at the point where we left off before we had to take that break on the stand. If you're just joining us, the widow of the alleged victim in this case. She is not only his widow, but she's also an eyewitness to the entire incident. Let's go back in where we left off. You don't recall being on the phone with someone named Anna? Anna? Yeah. Or Ivan, Ivan, Ivana? Ivana, Ivana. yes. Ivana. I, I apologize, That's Ivana. Okay. Um, yes, I called Ivana, and I, yes, I called Ivana. And you were on the phone with Ivana at the time that you approached the body, correct? Yes. Okay, and Ivana is, is she I, married to, is, she, is Ivana married? I was, I wanted to stand there by my husband's body, so when I called her, I was standing there, yes. Okay. And, is, is Ivana married? Yes, she's married. And is her husband a police officer? No. Okay. Do you know what his occupation is? Her husband's occupation? Yes. He, actually not really, but he's a, he's a salesman. Okay. I don't know what company he works for, but he's a salesman and he travels a lot. Okay. All right. And do you recall someone coming to the scene um, who was a police officer at yes, the time? And who was that? Um, that individual is the boyfriend of my niece, my niece's boyfriend. What's your niece's name? Davina. Davina? Davina. Davina. Uh, D-A-V-I-N-A. -A. Okay, and you had occasion to be on a phone call with Davina, correct? You, you called Davina at some point? I never called Davina. Okay, how did Davina learn to come to the scene? Objection, Your Honor, speculation. Overruled, she can answer if she knows. I don't know how she heard of it, but I can assume that her mother called her. And what's her boyfriend's name? Um, Garrett, I don't know his last name, but it's Garrett. Say that again, ma'am. Garrett. Garrett? Garrett. Okay. And, and so Garrett is the police officer. Correct? He is a police officer. And he accompanied you at the time that you were given a statement in this case, correct? No, incorrect. Okay. Well, did Mr. Garrett, well, I'm sorry, did Garrett ever get into a police car with you? He did not. Okay. At this time, I want to go into the state's exhibit 83. I guess it's the same video. I, can I interrupt? Uh, no? Okay. Let him ask the question, please. Gotcha. Sorry. I did want to clarify something. Okay. What I recall is that he came to the squad car that I was in. I don't recall if he sat or not. Wait a minute. Let me, can I think a little bit on that, please? Sure. All right. Well, let's just get to the next question. Let's well, just move on. H hang on. You can think about it. He can come back to it. Okay. Let's go to the next question. If we can go to State Exhibit 83, I want to go to... I, I, re I remember now. He did sit with me. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry? I apologize. I do remember that he did sit for a second to, to tell me that, that my family was there. He wanted me to know that the family was there, that Ivana was there, Davina was there, Maria, and my children. So he did and next to you at the time you gave a statement, correct? Yes, I'm re if I remember correctly, yes. Okay. Now, I just want to back up a little bit now. 
you indicated when this, let's go back to the first incident. Mm -hmm. now, on the first incident, you, you know, we, we got, you indicate that Mr. Edgecombe was going the wrong direction is what your statement is, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And at that particular time, you indicated on direct that your husband yelled out, what the heck, correct? That's what I recall. Okay. All right. And in fact, you were given several media interviews after this incident, correct? I believe it was two. Do you recall giving an interview to TMJ4? I, I do not. Okay. Do you recall giving an interview to CBS 58? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you recall giving an interview to Fox 6? I did an interview, the first interview. I don't remember which station it was with. Okay. So the, is it fair to say that the only other option would likely be WISN 12? I'm not sure. I was very distraught that day when they came to the house. And when you gave those interviews, when you were interviewed, you explained that your husband said, what the heck, correct? Yes. Okay. And do you recall on another interview saying that your husband said, your husband yelled out, hey, what's the problem? I, I don't re <clears throat> recall that. Okay. All right, so your, your recollection is that you, you solely said, your husband solely said, hey, what the heck, correct? The, All right. What the heck? All right. Now, when you gave those interviews, that was what, a, a couple days later, or how, how long of a period of time was that later? I was very distraught, and I still am very distraught over the loss of my husband. And a lot of things, I have been having trouble retaining. My short memory can, can, can be some foggy sometimes. It, I think it was a couple days after that they came to the house. Okay, so a couple days after you indicate <coughs> that your, your husband said, what the heck, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Then, did you indicate today that there was a statement when on direct where it was, uh, well, let me, let me stop there. Let's, let's go to uh, six minutes and uh, 22 seconds of this exhibit. It is time for us to take a break. A perfect time while they queue up that video. I promise you won't miss a moment of this testimony. We'll be back in the case in Wisconsin against defendant Theodore Edgecombe and hear more from the widow of who the state says is the alleged victim in that fatal shooting. Thanks for staying with us. Let's go back into the courtroom together. At this point, defense counsel is walking the witness through some of the video evidence that's key in this case. Let's watch. Okay, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, stop, stop, please stop. You, you have your husband's on me. <laughs> So, Ms. Ms. Clearman, did you just say? Show us on the video. 
Yes. Is, is that a true statement, is what your husband said? I remember what the heck. I was distraught. Okay. I swear a lot. You said I'm sorry? I swear a lot. You swear a lot. Mm -hmm. OK. And then did you indicate on direct that So whose who's, who's words were those on September 22nd? That was me explaining my, I was upset. I was explaining it to my sister because she was not believing me. And okay. so I was upset and so I used That is Garrett. Okay, and Garrett ultimately ends up in the police car with you, correct? Everything's so foggy right now. Um, Ms. Claren, can you, I know it's not easy, can you just speak up a little? Um, now I'm not sure. So you're not sure if that guy ended up in the police car with you? I know someone was sitting next to me. I don't know if it was Garrett or if it was the other detective. All right. Now, I just want to, you know, just kind of go back a little bit. So we got to the first incident, right? And you mentioned on direct that you were just leaving a bar called Scaffities, correct? Scaffities. Scaffities, okay. And before I start here, you, you, your husband is, he was a, Pretty tall guy. He was about 6'3", correct? Yes, he was 6'3". And he weighed 250 pounds, correct? 220, 225. He was very proud of himself for losing weight. So he was 220, 225. Okay, but if I, if I submit to you that the autopsy report indicated 250 pounds, would you have any reason to dispute that? No. Okay. Now... You indicated on direct that you had a glass of wine, correct? Yes, I had one glass of wine. Right. And your husband, you mentioned, had three beers. Is that right? I remember three beers. And that's what you testified to on direct, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it possible that because your, your memory is a bit foggy that he could have had a lot more than three beers? It's possible he had maybe four beers, three to four beers. Is it possible that he also had anything other than beer on September 22nd? What do you mean by other? Is it possible that he had any other type of alcoholic beverage outside of beer? Like. Can you give me an example? You mean like a shot or? Well, did, did your husband take shots? No, okay. he only drank beer. Okay, so the only thing he would have would be beer. Just correct? beer. All right, and you've been made aware obviously in this case that the autopsy report that his blood alcohol level was a 0 0.12, correct? Yes. Okay, and <laughs> you would, you would, no, are you familiar with blood alcohol levels? Like, you know. No. Okay. Do you, if I submitted to you that the legal limit was a .8 in this state, would you have any reason to, to disbelieve that? You're telling me the, that that's the legal limit? I'm asking, do you have a reason to believe? Your Honor, the legal limit is point oh eight. Yeah, yeah, point oh eight. Let's clarify, it's point zero eight to operate the vehicle in Wisconsin. Point That's zero. the law. Point zero 0.08, Ms. Clearman. Point zero 0.08 is the legal limit. Right. Okay. You aware of that? I am now. Okay. 
and your husband's, the autopsy report indicated that your husband's limit was a 0 0.12, correct? That is correct. Okay. And that would be one and a half times the legal limit, correct? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Now, you indicated that your husband drove to Scafidi's, correct? He drove to Scafidi's? Scafidi's. Yes. Yes. I'll get it right one of these times. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So he, he drove there, right? Yes, he does, drove there. Does he normally do the driving when you two are together? No. no. Usually I do the driving. Like, I drive him to court. We share one vehicle. Okay. Okay, we don't have two vehicles. We only own one. And um, sometimes he'll drive to work. Sometimes I'll drive to work, uh, depending if he has you know, to go to an immigration interview. If he, if he has to go to an immigration interview, he's in his suit and then I drive and I drop him off. Okay. But I think I do most of the driving. Okay, but when he came out of Scafidi's, did I get it right that time? Yes. Okay, all right. So when he came out of Scafidi's, he insisted at that moment that you do the driving, correct? He, he's, when you use the word insist. Well, he, he request. He, he, he asked, correct? He said, honey, you can drive home. Okay. And do you believe that that was a request was made based off the drinking he had been doing that night? Uh, no. I think he was tired. Okay. Now, you're also aware on the autopsy report that is, it's claimed that there was THC in his system, correct? Well, that's what I understand now, yes. Okay. Um, did your husband use marijuana? Objection, Your Honor. The testimony is not that there actually was THC. It was not confirmed. The same. The testimony was that there was THC metabolites. That's what the medical examiner testified to. Let's keep an accurate record and ask accurate questions. Yeah, I thought I used the word claimed, but okay. Um, Ms. Clareman, does your husband use marijuana? Objection, Your Honor. I missed that. What was the question again? Does your husband use marijuana, or did he use marijuana? That Judge, I'm objecting. Uh, overruled. She can answer. Um, he he did for chronic neck pain. He did once in a while. He did once in a while. Mm-hmm. On September twenty second. Do you recall him using marijuana? I never saw him. Okay. I've never witnessed him. All right. Just to clarify, ma'am, you did not see him on the day in question use marijuana? I did not see my husband use marijuana. Okay. All right. And to your knowledge, he didn't have a prescription. We have to take a break as we're nearing the top of the hour. Don't go anywhere. You're not going to miss a moment of this. We're hitting the pause button. We'll take you right back into the courtroom where we're leaving off. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm your midday host, Julie Grant. We thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. We've been covering the road rage shooting case happening in the state of Wisconsin. The defendant is Theodore Edgecombe. There was a homicide that occurred back in September of 2020. The question this jury is going to have to decide is whether or not that homicide was justified. The state says it was an unlawful killing. They've charged the defendant with murder. We understand through what his defense team had said so far that he is going to claim self-defense. We'll know for sure when the state finishes its case in chief. Uh, we suspect that they're winding their case down. One of the most key witnesses is on the stand right now, the widow of the alleged victim in this case. Her name is Evangelina Clearman. She is the, the wife who sur survived the, the death of her husband, Jason Clearman, and she's also an eyewitness to the confrontation and the shooting. Let's go back in exactly where we left off with more of her cross-examination. To your knowledge, he didn't have a prescription for marijuana, did he? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Ms. Clearman, have you at any point used marijuana? No. Ads are relevant, sustained. Although she answered and said no. Let's move on. 
Now, Ms. Clemmie indicated that after part per the body cam in your, your testimony, well, at least the statement on the body cam went. Sure. Um, after your husband says, After he is on, after I swerve, you mean? Mm -hmm. I continue driving. I'm asking. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And do you recall if you made contact with Mr. Adscom or not? What do you mean by contact? Do you recall ever coming into contact with Mr. Adscom with the vehicle? What do you mean by I that? I think he's asking, correct me if I'm wrong, Thompson. Did your car ever touch? Mr. Edgecomb and or the bicycle? No. And how did you come to that conclusion? I didn't, my vehicle never touched him. I swerved around him and he was still biking. As I looked in my rearview mirror, he was still biking in the direction that he started to bike in. Okay. So you're, you're alleging that Mr. Edgecomb never got off that, he never fell off the vehicle? He never fell off the vehicle? I mean, off of his bike. He did not fall off his bike. Okay, and you know that because you, you're, going, you're continually going forward, correct? I'm going straight, but I looked in my rear view mirror. Okay, and so you're driving straight, but you're looking at the rear view mirror at the same time? Oh, I glanced. Okay, so you glanced. Dude. So you don't know if Mr. Edgecombe would have ever fell off the bike onto another vehicle and at some point got back on his bike. He did not fall off his bike. He was still riding his bike. Okay, but you, and you, and you know that because you just glanced in the rearview mirror at some point, right? Yes. Now, you're heading toward Houghton, the intersection of Houghton and Brady, correct? You're on Brady and you're headed toward Houghton, right? Yes. Okay. And you're stopped. You come, your vehicle comes to a stop at that point? Yes, the, turn, the light turned red and I stopped. Okay, and were you surprised when Mr. Edgecombe ended up on the passenger side of the vehicle? I was very surprised. Okay, so there's been a time that you weren't looking in your rearview mirror the whole time to see Mr. Edgecombe approach the vehicle, correct? No, I was not. Okay, so at least there was some period of time that you don't know what Mr. Edgecombe was doing, correct? Correct. I, I saw him continuing to ride his bike, so I was not thinking that he was, I didn't think to think anything other than I'm going on, I'm going home. Okay. And your direct testimony was that Mr. Edgecombe says to your husband, hey, were you talking to me? Correct? When he approached the vehicle, he said, hey, are you talking to me? Right. Those are the only words that Mr. Edgecombe said before. Those are the only words that I remember. And then your husband replied, yeah, I was talking to you. He just said yes. Okay. And then at that point, Mr. Edgecombe punched Mr. Clearman, correct? Yes. All right. Now, Mr. Edgecombe never made a threat to you, did he? No. He never made a verbal threat to you? Never, never made a verbal threat to me. Okay. He never mentioned at any time that he had a weapon on his person, correct? We never exchanged words. Okay, so Mr. Ed so Mr. Edgecombe never said, you know, I have a gun, correct? I never heard him speak a word to me, no. Okay, and he never said that to Mr. Clearman either, correct? No. And Mr. Edgecombe also never brandished a weapon. He never raised a shirt, showed a weapon. He never put anything out. Is that true? I didn't, s he was on his bike, he punched my husband and he rode off. Okay, I just wanna kinda, before we go to that point, I wanna just kinda stay, at, stay right here at the time the punch was made. Mr. Edgecombe never displayed a firearm at that time that he punched Mr. Clement, did he? I can't say because I didn't see his hands, I just, saw that he, my husband was struck and his glasses flew off and so I didn't see a weapon. Okay, and he, so he never made any 
indication of having a weapon or threatening of any type of weapon whatsoever at that time, correct? No, he did not. Okay, and for all you know, Mr. Edgecombe didn't have a weapon at all at that point, right? Yes, it's okay. fair to say. Okay. So you mentioned that this happened pretty quick, right? Yes. So Mr. Edgecombe punches Mr. Clearman, right? Yes. All right, let's, let's, let's go to the punch. Um, if we go to, what is it, State 80? Okay, stay if you pass up your mind plan at this point. I want to stop right here, please. Now, Ms. Clearman, is this the vehicle that you were driving on the night of September 22nd of 2020? Well, there are many Kias. There are many Kias, so I want to make sure that is our vehicle. You, you, you want to take a look at the, does this refresh any of your recollection? Do you remember being behind a Reinhardt truck? No, I don't remember being behind a, a Reinhardt truck. Okay. You want to take a second look at this vehicle to see if it's... Or if you want to come closer to the court. Well, I mean, it, it looks like my vehicle. Okay. All right. And you have no reason to think otherwise that that is likely your vehicle, September 22nd, correct? Well, it's hard to tell. I don't know who's in the vehicle. Okay. All right. We'll continue playing, please. Okay. I want to stop it right okay. here. Okay. That can you confirm that this is your vehicle at this point? Um, I can't. I can't. I... Okay. All right. Fair enough. Council, if you mind, continue playing. Can you stop, please? Right there. Do you see a bicyclist coming along at this point right here? Yes. Okay. Is that Mr. Edgecombe? I don't know. Okay. All right. Council, if you continue playing. <clears throat> and if you could stop right there, Council. So Mr. Edge came, came from a pretty far distance, right? You were, you were a pretty good uh, uh, amount of space between you guys, right? It appears that way. All right. Would you, if we could back up maybe five seconds.
Do you see Mr. Edgecombe in frame at this point? Barely. Okay. Can we back up maybe five more seconds, please? Okay. We can stop right there. Do you see Mr. Edgecombe in frame on this video? No. Okay. So Mr. Edgecombe was at least at least a half a block behind you, correct? Uh, yes. Because you don't see him in his frame, right? No. You would agree that the distance up to this point would probably be close to about a half a block or so, right? A uh, block, about block and a half. About a block and a half distance? Yes. Okay. Counsel, you can continue to play. So Mr. Edgecombe, it appears that a bicyclist is now coming in frame, correct? Yes. All right. Yes. And if we could, you could take. All right, there, it, it was hard to see, but he was just starting to come up behind their car uh, that she was driving, that she had trouble uh, identifying it uh, at this point today. Uh, let us know what you think of her testimony so far. We're gonna pause things there. We'll get you back in for more testimony right after this. Thanks so much for staying with us. We're going to go back into the courtroom exactly where we left off. And what you want to pay attention to is what direction the defendant was coming from. Because remember, this widow of the alleged victim had said initially when she encountered the bicycle, he was coming straight toward her car and she had to swerve to miss him. And in this frame that we're seeing here, he's coming up from behind the car. Take a look. Okay, stop right here, please. Now, you mentioned that Mr. Edgecombe surprised you when he came to the vehicle, right? Yes. So you didn't see Mr. Edgecombe when he got to this place, right? No. So for at least a block, block and a half distance, you didn't have, it, had any indication where Mr. Edgecombe was, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Counsel, we continue playing. I want to stop right there. So is this the point where Mr. Well, have you identified this being your vehicle at this time? Yes, that's my vehicle. Okay, then. and the person that's approaching the vehicle, do you know who that is at this point? The man on the bike. Do you recognize that to be the defendant in this case? I haven't looked at him. Okay, you want to look at him? Not really. Okay, I understand. All right, so, counsel, you can continue playing. Okay, can you stop right there, please? Is that the way that you recall the incident playing out when your husband was struck by Mr. Edgecombe? Yes, but can you, yes, but can you rewind it a little bit? Sure. Yes, that's what I recall. Okay, so at this time, I want to, I want you to focus in on the passenger door as, as we get ready to play it now. So you go ahead, counsel. Okay, stop it right there. We go, can we go back, please? I'm sorry. Right there is good. Uh, back up a little bit farther. Okay, let's play it again. And I want to stop it very quickly as we... Stop it right there, please. So Mr. Clearman has now opened his door at this point, correct? Are you asking me based on the video that I'm looking at? Yes. Or based on my recollection? Well, let's, let's, we can start. Based off the video, do you see a door open? Based on the video, I see the door open ajar. Okay. And that purports to be your husband, Mr. Clearman, opening that door, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, just so that we're clear, at this point, you haven't had a conversation with, Mr. with your husband at this point. This surprised you, right? Yes. Your husband is struck by a punch, mm -hmm. and then he immediately opens the door, correct? Based on the video, but my recollection, I don't recall him opening the door. Okay. 
But you don't dispute at this point, based off the video, you see that he did open the door, correct? I'm sorry, Tom, I can hear you. Uh, <clears throat> based off this video, don't, you don't dispute that Mr. Clement did open the door at this point, right? Yes. Okay. Now, prior to Mr. Clement opening that door, he didn't have a conversation with you at that within a couple seconds, did he? You didn't have a conversation with your husband prior to him opening the door, correct? Mm. No. Okay. So, him opening, the, Mr. Clement opening the door was responsive to being punched, correct? Well, yes, it kind of calls for speculation, but she was right there. She's witnessing the whole thing. She can answer if she knows. Okay, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I can remember. Um, so, when you Mr. Said him opening the door was responsive to the punch. That was the question, I think. Yes, thanks, Your Honor. I'm not sure. Okay, all right. So, Mr. Clement, at this point, doesn't indicate to you, I want to talk to him, right? He didn't make that statement, did he? Mr. Edgecombe, you said? Mr. Mr. Clearman, Jason Clearman, okay. he didn't t tell you, I want to talk to him, correct? No, he did not, not at that point. He didn't say anything to you at this point, did he? At, after he was punched and his glasses flew off and then he touched his face, he told me he was bleeding. Okay. And that was a conversation. But he never indicated to you at this point that he wanted to talk to Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Cur no, he did not. Okay, so prior to opening the door, he never said, I want to talk to him. Fair enough? Yes. Okay, all right. Now I want you to now look at Mr. Edgecombe on a bicycle, right? That's the individual that struck your husband, correct? Yes, based on the video, yes. Okay, and at this moment, Mr. Edgecombe appears to be going straight, correct? The corner's right a few feet from where he is right now. But at this very moment, he's going straight, correct? Yes. At this very moment, Mr. Edgecombe is not posing a threat anymore beyond that punch that he just threw, correct? Yes. Okay, so just to, just to be clear, Mr. Edgecombe is not a threat to you at this moment, correct? Can you ask that? We're hitting the pause button because we have to take a break. And I also want to correct something. Um, it, it was a little confusing to me at what point they were playing the video. And the first time they encountered each other, the, the witness on the stand, the widow, is saying that Theodore Edgecombe was riding his bicycle toward her. I was thinking that she was contradicting herself when I was seeing that video just played, but she wasn't. It was like there was a little bit of a break in time, as we saw just explained from the second time they encountered each other when he drove up, uh, or rode up, I should say, on his bicycle behind them uh, to then proceed to punch the alleged victim in this case. We'll continue with our coverage right after this quick break. We thank you for spending part of your Friday afternoon with us here at Court TV. We thank you so much for being with us on this Friday afternoon here at Court TV. I'm Julie Grant, your midday host. We are in the road rage shooting case in Wisconsin. Right now, the widow of the alleged victim in the case is on the stand giving testimony. She's on cross-examination, and the defense attorney is going through the various encounters that she and her husband had with the defendant on that night. First, she said that the defendant was riding his bicycle in her lane of traffic. She had to swerve to miss him. And then she said, if she looked back in her rear view, he kept going. Well, then we just saw some video where he rides up behind them, pulls up alongside on the passenger side of the vehicle where her husband was sitting and then punches her husband right in the face, making him bleed, knocking his glasses off. Let's go back in where we left off. Mr. Edgecombe is, we'll say, a couple feet away from the vehicle, correct? He's a couple feet away from the vehicle. He, he, the bike is now angled to go straight at this moment? Yes. He's not a threat to you at this moment, correct? Not to me, no. He wouldn't be a threat to your husband at this moment either, correct?
I'm not sure. Okay. Well, at this point, Mr. Edge comes back is to your vehicle, correct? Yes. Okay. And you have full control of the vehicle at this point, correct? Yes. You get to make the decisions on what you do with that vehicle as the sole person in charge of that vehicle at that moment, right? Yes. Okay. Now, from the position we're facing now, let me see if I can. I'm now showing this clearman what has been marked as Defense Exhibit 5, for the record. This one, man. All right. So this, does this area look familiar to you? No. Yes, it does. All right, so this is a fair and accurate representation of, you know, the uh, area in which you were on on uh, September 22nd of 2020. Yes. And you were headed, uh, would it be east? Well, you were headed west on Brady Street, correct? West on Brady, And yes. you're going toward Houghton Street, right? Yes. Okay. And you were on your way home that night, correct? Yes. And you would have proceeded the direction of going toward Houghton Street and then making a left turn to go home, right? No. I okay, which, which way would you go? Continued straight. Okay, you would continue straight. Uh, to Water Street. To Water Street. So you would actually pass Houghton Street, correct? Yes. There would be no reason to make a turn at all on Houghton Street to go home, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, Ms. Ms. Clearman, you indicated that you seen Mr. Edge come at the time that you had to swerve, correct? I saw him at the time I had to swerve. All right, and you would have noticed the type of attire that Mr. Edge was wearing at that time, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. How would you describe what Mr. Edgecombe is wearing at this moment? A white shirt with a black vest. Okay. And that was apparent to you at the time that you made the first incident that occurred, correct? The incident happened that happened prior on Brady, right? Yes. You noticed that he had a black vest, white shirt, correct? No, I, I, I can't say that I knew his attire when I swerved. Okay, but you looked back in your rearview mirror, correct? Yeah, I focused on the, just the, the, the figure. Okay, so you weren't paying attention to what he, what he was wearing at that moment, right? It all happened so quickly and I was still driving. Okay. So you don't, you don't know what he was wearing at that time through your rearview mirror, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, you see Mr. Ed's cone now on the right side of your vehicle, correct? Yes. And were you able to see him on September 22nd at this time? No, I was looking for the glasses, so I don't know which, which way he was going. Okay. But at some point, your husband said, follow him, correct? He did not say follow him. Your husband never said follow Mr. Edgecombe? He never used those words. He never said follow Mr. Edgecombe. Is there any words that Mr. Clearman used? When I started driving, when the light turned green, he said, turn the corner. I want to talk to him. Okay. Now, 
in order for you to know where Mr. Edgecombe was, you would have to be able to see him ahead of you, correct? I would have to s You have to see Mr. Edgecombe in order to go to in the direction of Mr. Edgecombe, right? I wasn't going in his direction. I was driving and then my husband turned me to turn the corner. So I didn't see him. If he went turn the corner or went straight, I didn't see him. And when your husband said, turn right, you want to talk, he wanted to talk to Mr. Edgecombe, right? He said, turn the corner, I want to talk to him. So you were looking for Mr. Edgecombe so that you could enable Mr. Clearman to get in the vicinity of Mr. Edgecombe in order for him to talk to him, correct? I turned the corner, yes, because he asked me to, and when I saw him, I stopped my vehicle. Okay, when you saw Mr. Edgecombe, right? When I saw the man on the bike. The man on the bike, okay. Council, one or two more questions, and we're gonna break for lunch, it's almost noon. You can pick up after lunch, but one or two more well, questions. We can pick up after lunch, I'm fine with that, guy. Yeah. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost noon, we're gonna break for lunch. <clears throat> I appreciate, and ma'am, you can step down. The cross-examination isn't over. It is just time for the lunch break. So we are an hour behind here in the east where we, or an hour ahead, excuse me, in the east where we're headquartered. They're an hour behind in Wisconsin where we are. Uh, so just about an hour from now, the judge keeps a very tight schedule. This jury will be back to hear more of the defense cross. Then it will be time for the state's redirect examination of the widow of the man who was shot and killed back on September 22nd, 2020. A father, a husband, and an immigration attorney, Jason Clearman, is the man who was killed, and this jury is going to have to decide whether or not the shooting was justified. We'll be right back.